Hi, I'm Andy, and uh, this series is called Maths, the fun parts, and it's the best bits of maths, the bits that I really love about maths. Um, if you are sceptical or you've always found maths difficult or hard, uh, maybe this will encourage you that some bits of maths are really cool, some bits are difficult and hard and boring and useful. Uh, this is about the fun, exciting bits that are uh, not, not, not really useful. I mean, actually, some of them are useful, unfortunately, but we love them because they're cool and exciting and interesting. Uh, today we are talking about graph theory, one of my other favourite bits. If you missed ones about sets and groups, uh, go back and find them. So we're going. We're talking about graphs. We've done sets and groups. Um, the, some of the the stuff we do requires you to know a bit about sets to understand this one, but probably not much, right? So it's mostly it's mostly pictures today. So uh, uh, if equations make you queasy. You're going to like it. Okay, so what is a graph? So the first thing to say is a graph in maths, in graph theory, um, is absolutely nothing to do with uh, graphs of like uh, like charts that show like numbers over time or something like that. Uh, that's it's just that, that's just a different meaning of this word. Uh, what we're talking about today is dots and lines. A graph in maths is some dots and some lines. And you might think that I'm joking and actually there's more to it than that, um, but I, I'm not. Like it actually is just dots and lines. Sometimes the lines have arrows on them. Um, but we don't call them dots and lines, because that wouldn't sound clever enough. We call them vertices, those are the dots, and edges, those are the lines. And to, uh, edges especially is a slightly confusing word until you get used to it. Um, if you hear me in this video talking about nodes, that's because sometimes the dots are called nodes instead of vertices. Um, I'll try not to say nodes, but I might accidentally say nodes. Uh, yeah, so vertices and edges, dots and lines. Some of the dots are connected by lines, and that's what a graph is. Okay, so um, if we were doing um, programming, um, we would be uh, representing the data structure. Actually, it's really quite difficult to represent these data structures in a neat way in programming. Um, but here's one possible way we might do it. I'm using TypeScript for my examples, but there's just to illustrate, you don't need to know TypeScript, hopefully, to get the idea. Um, so we've called something, we've created some, an interface called finite graph. Um, we're not going to talk about infinite graphs, by the way, though such things do exist, but I don't know anything about them. Um, so we're talking about finite graphs, which are graphs which have a finite number of vertices. Um, yeah, so to be a finite graph, to be a graph, you need to have a method that gives you back some vertices and a method that gives you back uh, some edges, which are the things that join vertices. And you can see that the vertices are just an array of um, whatever type. Like often when you define graphs in programming, you can say that the nodes might be strings or they might be numbers or they might be something clever. Um, and then edges are uh, edges is an array of pairs of the same type of thing. Just, it just means an edge is a way of saying this vertex is joined to this vertex, right? And every time you want a pair of things to say this is joined to this, that's an edge, and you put a pair of those things into the array. Um, so that's an interface for a graph. So let's look at a concrete graph, a very very simple one. Um, this is called K three. And it's a finite graph, and the vertices are strings here, so it's a little bit easier to think about. Um, so the vertices method uh, returns just A, B, and C. So there are three dots, three vertices in this graph. And then the edges also return three things. There's A joined to B, B joined to C, and A joined to C. So that is like that. what that means is that all the dots are joined to each other by one, each, of the, each pair is joined by one edge. And in this graph, there's no directionality there. So we could have put BA instead of AB. Um, uh, yeah, so we just arbitrarily put them in alphabetical order. OK, so that was an example of a graph. And that graph would look like, like just one of the triangles on this in this graph. So now I'm showing an example of uh, another graph. This is a graph where from every vertex, there is a path to every other vertex. No vertex is stuck on its own. There's no groups of vertices isolated from each other. So this is a connected graph. That's just a bit of terminology we need. Uh, and this graph, with that edge missing, is disconnected because from some of the vertices, you can't get to some of the other vertices. So let's look at how we would do that in code. Uh, it's not, not a straightforward piece of code, unfortunately. This is what I mean about um, co programming and code around graphs. Uh, it's not as simple as you'd like it to be. Um, it's really nice to just draw the diagrams on a piece of paper, and it's harder to write um, programs about them. Um, so maybe there's a, uh, a use to maths then. If we can prove some stuff on paper, never have to write the code, our lives will be easier. OK, so here's a function to work out whether a graph is connected. It takes in this graph called G, 
Uh, and what it does is it makes this found variable, which is a list of all the vertices we found so far. So it starts off just being one of the vertices. We chose like the first one in the graph. Um, are we obviously assuming here that there's there's at least one vertex in the graph? Um, and then what we do is we we start with um, we start with one of the that one we start with that one vertex and we we ask for all the paths from that vertex uh, and then for each path we go through and say if we haven't already found this vertex add it to the found list. So all paths from I'm not actually going to show you the implementation but basically. It, this is just like all the all the ways you can walk out from this uh, vertex um, to to add the other vertices in the in the graph by following edges, um, and it's just annoying. That's why I'm not going to show it to you. But you can imagine how it's implemented. Uh, and then all we do is, if we found the right number of vertices, so we must have covered the whole graph, then it is connected because we've found all uh, all the other vertices by walking away from this one. Um, otherwise. Um, if if we haven't found all of them, because the length of found is less than the length of the total number of vertices, then it's not connected. Simple as that. Annoying to implement. Okay, let's give you a little bit more terminology. Uh, let's talk about the degree of a vertex. So here's a vertex uh, in the middle there, and it's got some edges coming out of it. And we haven't drawn the rest of the graph, but the rest of the graph is there. Um, the degree of a vertex is the number of edges coming out of it. So in this case, the degree of this vertex V is 4. Okay, simple enough, I hope. Uh, how we would implement this in code would be uh, loop through all the edges. Um, and if, if yeah, if this edge either goes into or comes out of uh, our vertex, then we add one to the number, the degree. So essentially, any, any edge that touches V increases the count, and when we count all of them, and that's the degree of the vertex. Okay, so now probably the hardest bit of this video is how to pronounce Eulerian, right? So Euler was this very famous mathematician. He invented this thing called an Eulerian circuit. So this is an idea in graph theory. And an Eulerian circuit is a, a path through a graph where you visit every edge once and only once, and you get back where we started. So the circuit part means getting back where we started. Um, and he did this famous thing with the Konigsberg bridges. Okay, so um, here is an example of an Eulerian circuit. We've got a, um, a graph with four vertices and some edges connecting them. And then you can see beautifully illustrated a, part, a circuit that goes around, covers all the edges, doesn't, doesn't care about the vertices, by the way, just covers all the edges and gets back where it started. Uh, can we find an Eulerian circuit in this graph? Have a little think about that. And the answer is, yes, you can. Um, you can do a kind of figure of eight in that graph and you can get back to where you started and cover all the edges. Uh, what about this graph? Can you find an Eulerian circuit in this graph? Well, no, you can't because it's not connected. So uh, it's kind of a prerequisite to be able to have find an Eulerian circuit. It's got to be connected. What about this graph? Can you find an Eulerian circuit in this graph? This is a bit harder. What do you think? Well, you can find a path that covers all the edges in the graph. Here's the one that we've drawn here, starting at start, ending at end. But, so it does touch all the edges once, but it doesn't end up where you started. It ends up somewhere else. So no, you can't find an Eulerian circuit in this graph. What you can find is an Eulerian trail, which might be useful, but it's not the same thing. So an Eulerian trail is something that touches all the edges once, you know, walks all the edges once, uh, but doesn't necessarily end up where you started. Okay, so those was, that, that's our introduction to an Eulerian circuit. Why are we talking about them? Well, because we're going to figure out some maths about them. Okay, so here is um, our first statement of um, mathematical facts. Okay, so if you didn't see the... Um, uh, the set theory video, some of this stuff's going to look uh, intimidating, but that's fine. I'm going to talk you through it right now, so don't worry. Um, so what we're doing here is we're making a statement. We're saying, if this, then that. And the arrow in the middle means that if, then that. If, then type thing, right? So the top thing says, if a graph has an Eulerian circuit in it, then um, for all 
the vertices in the graph, the degree of that vertex is even. So every vertex in the graph has an even number of edges connected to it. Uh, if there's an Eulerian circuit, that must be true. And I've written obviously question mark below because that's the kind of thing that your maths lecturer will say. And then you're supposed to go away and figure it out. So let's do the going away and figuring it out. So imagine that there is an Eulerian circuit in a graph. Um, and let's think about one of the vertices in that graph. And what we have to convince ourselves is if you, you, you found a circuit that covers all the edges um, and gets back where it started, then every time you enter this vertex or an edge, you must then leave again by another edge in order to make up that circuit that gets back to where it started. Um, you must, you must, every time you enter it, you must leave. Therefore, hopefully, that makes it obvious that the degree of this vertex must be even because every, every entering edge needs a leaving edge as well. Right? So now we, we can change, obviously, to not have a question mark. We can say, yes, if a graph has an Eulerian circuit in it, uh, then the degree of all the vertices must be even. Okay, but it's much more profound than that. That was the easy part. But Karl Heyerholtzer proved something called Euler's theorem, um, which is that actually it goes the other way too. If you have a graph that's connected and all the vertices have even degree, then that graph does have an Eulerian circuit in it. Now that, at least to me, that's really surprising. And you can imagine how this might be useful. I know I said we don't care about things being useful, but imagine you needed to know whether a graph had an Eulerian circuit in it for something you were doing in a game or whatever. Um, instead of having to find that circuit, maybe it's good enough to just know there is one um, or know there isn't one so you don't bother searching, say. Uh, and you can find out for definite, for sure, if your graph is connected and all the vertices have even degree, then it, it does have an Eulerian circuit. So uh, there's some useful maths for you. We're not going to prove it. It's too hard. Uh, it's totally non-obvious if you think about it, I think. Uh, but it is true. And that's maths. Okay, so um, let's talk about directed graphs. So the graphs we were looking at before were undirected graphs because there were no arrows on the lines. So the arrows on the lines generally mean when I'm walking around them, I'm going to follow the arrows. Or they could mean anything at all you like. But um, here's an example of a directed graph. Um, by the way, the graphs I showed you only had one edge between the two vertices in all the cases I showed you. Actually, there could be more than one edge between two vertices, uh, or even edges that go from one vertex to itself, but we haven't talked about those things. Um, uh, yeah. So in this case, the reason I mention that is there are two edges that go between the same two vertices, but in this case, they go in opposite directions. Those are the ones in the middle there. Um, but you could have multiple that go the same direction that between the two vertices. Um, sometimes you exclude that stuff because you're not interested in it. Sometimes you don't. Um, but yeah, uh, anyway, a directed graph is a graph with vertices and edges, but each of those edges has a direction. Like a, there's a from and a to uh, aspect to the, um, the line that's being drawn between the two vertices. Okay, so let's take a diversion into something called Secret Santa. Secret Santa is sort of a game some people play uh, often at Christmas, uh, which is why it's called Secret Santa. Um, and uh, it's called Secret Santa because like, often you keep secret who you're buying a present for. But anyway, essentially what happens is um, everyone has to uh, get hold of a present and everyone gets given a present. Um, and like it's random who gives to whom or, um, uh, or it's even secret who gives to whom. So that's the game of Secret Santa. Sounds very simple. Oh, except um, it's probably good if you don't give a present to the person you also receive a present from, because that kind of messes up the feeling that it's all random. Um, oh, and also, I don't want to buy uh, a present for my wife, um, because like we're already getting presents for each other, um, so there's extra rules. Oh, and then also there's the extra rule that makes sure so-and-so doesn't buy for so-and-so, because last year was a total disaster because they have no idea. Right, so you end up, when you're running a Secret Santa system, with quite a complex set of rules about who can buy for whom. Um, so imagine all the people are vertices, um, and imagine we draw a directed graph um, saying uh, there's a line from A to B if A could buy for B, right? 
Um, then we can draw a whole directed graph that looks a bit like this. Um, and we're trying to, so this is all the possibilities, right? This is who could give to someone. It's not who's, who is giving to someone. You can see some people here have got multiple arrows coming out of them or going into them, but you only get you only buy one present in Secret Santa. Um, so this is all the possible buyings that could happen. Um, and what your job is, if you're running the Secret Santa system, is to find one way that everyone buys one present and receives one present. And although this isn't the only way you could do that, the way I've chosen to think about that in my Secret Santa system is that uh, you need to find a circuit in this directed graph that I just showed you that visits all vertices. So Eulerian paths we were talking about before, they are about visiting all edges. I don't care about vertices. In this case, we want a circuit that visits all vertices once. We don't care about edges. Edges are just a way of, of doing the visiting. We don't care how many times we use an edge or um, uh, well, you know, we certainly don't care about not using some edges or anything like that. Um, okay, so so here's an example from that graph we were looking at before of an actual um, circuit that fulfills fits the rules. Like every vertex gets visited um, exactly once, uh, and this type of circuit is called a Hamiltonian circuit, named after someone called Hamilton. Um, and it's quite a lot harder to deal with than Eulerian circuits, surprisingly, but it can be done. Um, and just a little plug, um, uh, the reason why this is so interesting to me is because I implemented a, a Secret Santa system website um, at santacircles.artificialworlds.net, which you're free to use. Um, it's very, very simple, like there's no JavaScript whatsoever. It's, um, it's very web 1.0 because that's the way I like to do things. Um, Feature requests welcome, you know, it's missing features I would like. But you can organize your secret Santa using santacircles.artificialworlds.net. Um, and it won't cost you anything. There's no advertising, anything like that. It's completely just done because I wanted it and I wanted to share it with the world. Um, and so it doesn't have the annoying adverts that some things have. And you will have the pleasure of knowing that the this graph theory algorithm is operating in the background when you use it. Um, when it finds it finds the the right arrangement of people for you. Um, so here's how I implemented it. All that stuff's implemented in Rust. Um, and I made a pull request against PetGraph, which is one of the most popular graph theory libraries in Rust. Uh, and the implementation that I used is based on a paper by Frank Rubin from um, 1974, because as far as I could tell, that is the state of the art for how to find Hamiltonian paths and circuits um, in graphs. I couldn't find anyone who'd done anything interesting after 1974. So we're going to talk a little bit about what Frank Rubin's uh, algorithm was, because it's not as simple as, so for Eulerian circuits, um, to decide whether there is one, you just count the vertices, count the degrees of the vertices. For um, Hamiltonian paths, you've got to do a lot of searching around through all the nodes. There isn't a shortcut. Um, so the basic idea of, of Rubin's algorithm is um, exactly what I said, just try out all the paths until you either find one or you've decided that there isn't one because you've kind of run out of paths to try. Um, but the the key idea that, that Rubin brings is that each step um, where you're trying it out, um, you have a kind of partially completed path and you, you use a lot of little rules and heuristics to say, oh, well, if this partially completed path is right, then this edge can't, can't be there. Or, you know, like or stuff like that. And I'll show you some examples. So even though this is an algorithm that takes like order n squared or n factorial or anyway, it takes a, it takes a long time to complete if, if you've got a lot of vertices. It's much, much quicker than if you did it just the naive way. So this algorithm doesn't fundamentally change the fact that this is complex. Um, but it just makes it a lot shorter in practice. So here's an example of one of uh, Rubin's rules. Um, uh, if we're partway through building a path, um, and as as part of that path, um, we we have a a edge that we know is going to be there at least in this version of the path that we're building right now. That's the red arrow here, red line. Um, if we've got a edge that leaves this vertex. We know we can delete the other edges that leave this vertex because we've already visited this vertex. We're never going to be leaving it again, right? So that's just an example of one of the rules. Here's another example. 
Um, if we've got two definite edges that are definitely part of this path, um, and they both go into the same vertex, well then, this path that we're trying out right now is not valid. We can give up immediately. We don't have to keep on exploring and fi figure out whether it's a valid path. It's definitely not. So we can backtrack or whatever we do to go and find the next the next sort of plausible candidate for paths. So this is just uh, examples. Um, uh, Rubin's algorithm is essentially just some very sensible rules uh, that you apply to reduce the enormous combinatorial explosion of paths through the graph that you're exploring. Okay, so that was it for graph theory. Uh, that was it for graphs. I hope you thought that the um, this latest algorithm shows how you can kind of reason about graphs and how fun it is and how it doesn't um, often doesn't involve writing down uh, mathematical formulae. It involves drawing diagrams like this and going, hmm, well, if there's two lines like that, it must be that. Um, so it's really fun. It's a, a lovely bit of maths. There is a lot of writing down formulae as well, obviously, or notate mathematical notation. But hopefully you're not so scared of it after watching these videos. Hope you've enjoyed these videos. Um, I'm gonna sh I'm gonna introduce you to a few things I didn't talk about from all three in a second. But I just want to say if there's other topics from maths that you think I might love uh, or that you found really difficult and you'd like me to try and make more fun, uh, I can't guarantee anything. But uh, leave a comment and uh, let me know um, what you're thinking. And in, in any case, if any of this didn't make any sense to you, leave a comment and hopefully I'll try and um, sort you out in the comments. Meanwhile, let's talk about some things we didn't talk about from all three of these videos, right? So set theory, group theory, and graph theory. So let's start with uncountable infinity. So what we talked about in the set theory um, video was um, countable infinities. So for example, um, all the numbers that go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, you can count those by just going 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. But we also talked, I think, about how you can count all the integers, so the negative numbers as well as the positive. So what you can't do is say one, two, three, four, five, and then when I get to the end, start doing the negative numbers because you'll never get to the end. So what we do is we have to be a bit clever. We have to say you count like this: zero, one, minus one, two, minus two, three, minus three, and so on. And you you can eventually count all of them, or not all of them. You can you've given a, like a, a system of counting that will eventually count all of them, or count as arbitrarily far as you want to, um, and it and it will cover any number. Um, and there are actually, interestingly, there are there is a way to count all the fractions, even though that sounds particularly difficult because it feels like there are a lot of fractions. So at that point, you're thinking, oh well, I can count all the fractions. Um, that must be um, that must mean that I could count anything if I'm just clever enough. And the answer is no, you absolutely can't. And so there are definitely sets of numbers that are uncountably infinite in size. An example is what's called the real numbers, which is basically all the decimals, including like infinite decimals. Um, and yeah, it turns out you can't count that. There is no way. Someone has proved there's no way to count that. It, in some sense, it's bigger. That set is bigger than all the set, uh, the set of fractions. But in some weird sense, the set of fractions is the same size as the set of numbers one, two, three, four, because they're both countable. Now, those are things are like, it's, they're just mind blowing, right? So I'm not going to be able to sufficiently blow your mind. Let's move on to Russell's paradox. So Russell's paradox is um, a thing with set theory um, invented by Russell, um, which is about um, how set theory doesn't make sense at all. So the set theory that I explained to you in the first video is kind of a working person's definition of um, how you use sets when you're doing maths. Um, but actually, um, it's got some real problems in it. And the basic problem is, what if you've got a set of all sets that don't contain themselves? Does it contain itself? Now, I'm going to say that one more time, and then you're going to have to think about it. If you have a set of all the sets that don't contain themselves, does that set contain itself? And hopefully, if you pause the video, spin that around in your head a little bit, you'll figure out um, that it's an unanswerable question. And that means that set theory is in some way flawed. And there are ways of constructing set theory using different rules uh, and different definitions where you don't run into that paradox or that, that unanswerable question. Okay, other things that are of interest, the um, so-called directed acyclic graphs, DAGs, um, which are um, very useful in maths, very useful in uh, my work on matrix, actually. Um, uh, so these are graphs that don't have any circuits in them at all, uh, and all the lines have arrows on them, and they turn out to have very interesting, useful properties. Um, uh, Git uses a, a DAG um, for the commits, for example. 
Uh, they're just really useful, and Matrix uses it to store um, the events in a room. Okay, something else then. Back onto onto group theory. Um, there is this thing called the monster group. So they, there's a, this this incredible set. Like you, if you remember the group theory stuff, um, it was it's very very simple rules for a very very simple arithmetic um, where you can just do you can only do adding up or you know there's only one operation and th that operation behaves really really nicely. So you've you've created this tiny neat little world where arithmetic works really neatly, much more neatly than it does in real life. Um, and if you just look at all the finite sized groups, because there are infinite ones as well, then the mathematicians have been able to classify those groups into different categories. And I think there are 26 different categories. And that's all sounding fine. I mean, 26 is a bit of an odd number. Um, but then there is there is a number of groups that just don't fit into those categories. I think it might be 14. I wish I'd researched this. Um, but there's a number of groups that just don't fit into that um, uh, in, into that list of categories of kind of groups that make sense. And one of them is called the monster group, and it has an unbelievably large number of uh, elements in it, and it it fits no. It's not like any other group. Uh, there's an amazing, um, uh, amazing videos on YouTube about it by that channel, which I think is called Three Blue One Brown or something like that. Anyway, amazing video about that. You should watch that. Uh, also, last thing to mention. This is just things I'm mentioning in case you're interested and you want to follow them up. Uh, there's this theorem called the Four Color Theorem, uh, which is a bit of graph theory, but it doesn't sound like it at first because it talks about maps. So if you have a map. Uh, and you want to color in all the countries on the map. Imagine it's a like normal 2D map on a piece of paper. You want to color in all the countries. Uh, you've only got four pens or crayons, and you never want one country to touch another country that's the same color. So actually, if you re-cast re, um, that problem as a graph theory problem, you essentially say each country is a vertex, and anywhere that a country touches another country uh, um, is an edge between them, and because it's a so-called planar graph, because uh, it's on a piece of paper, uh, edges aren't allowed to cross over each other, which kind of makes sense if you think about so if you think about it for long enough, that's equivalent to being on a map where like countries can't leap over each other to touch each other. It turns out your four crayons was enough crayons, but it also turns out that's unbelievably hard to prove. And it took us hundreds of years, and the final proof of it, uh, took uh, a computer program checking uh, tens of thousands or anyway thousands and thousands of special cases in order to prove this very obviously true thing is true. The reason I say it's obviously true is because if you get a piece of paper, try and do it, you'll figure out pretty quickly that you could have done it with four colors. Like the first four colors, you the first coloring that you choose might not work, but you'll figure out that there there is a, a way of doing it. What's even more interesting is, if you allowed yourself one more crayon, so five colors, that's really, really easy to prove. Um, and there's a video on YouTube from me of me at the ACCU conference giving an outline of the proof of that uh, in a lightning talk. Um, it's like a couple of pages. So if you've got four crayons, easy to prove. Yep, no problem. I can color in. If you've got four, it is absolutely true. You can color them in. It's actually quite easy to actually color them in. But it's really, really hard to prove for sure that there will never be a map where that rule gets broken. All right, too much waffling about things we didn't talk about. Um, if you're interested in more stuff by me, have a look at artificialworlds.net. Have a look at my blog on artificialworlds.net slash blog. Um, if you like little web games or you want to write little web games, go to smallpixel.artificialworlds.net. That's hard to spell. Um, uh, if you want recordings of my videos, go to Diode Zone. Uh, if you want to hear about my live streams and stuff like that, go to at Andy Balaam at mastodon.social. Uh, I will follow that rather. Um, if you like uh, games that are a bit like Lemmings, check out Rabbit Escape. There's loads more stuff. Have a look at artificialworlds.net. Um, hit me up on Mastodon. Leave a comment. Thanks for watching. Hope you feel slightly more positive about maths. <laughs>